Hey everybody, welcome back to Bayes. So we are at the end of the semester. We're on our last unit. This is a very exciting unit for me to teach uh, because I feel like this is where we become um, uh, ultimately useful because uh, the type of models we'll be talking about are called multi-level models, sometimes called hierarchical models, sometimes called mixed models, um, sometimes called mixed effects models. They can really apply to just about any situation, um, any kind of data analysis situation that the world throws at you. So I'm very excited to, to show this and uh, we'll have to rely on our understanding of all Bayesian material to date. That being said, I think we can do it. Uh, we have three lectures left. Uh, we have about 50 slides of hard hitting material. So stick with me guys. All right, why do we care about multi-level models? Well, thus far, we have assumed that our data are mutually independent. Mathematically, we started the semester showing that our likelihood was composed using independent and identically distributed likelihoods evaluated at each observation. So remember, uh, we didn't care what order we summed that log likelihood together. And the other way to think about it is if we assume their observations are mutually independent, you just rearrange the rows of the data and get exactly the same analysis back. Because each row doesn't matter you know, what row one, row 51 is. Uh, the other way this is called sometimes is exchangeable. Exchangeability, exchangeable assumption. You can exchange row one and row 51 and not affect the results of the analysis at all. But there are many, many cases out there where our observations actually consist of multiple population strata. And that's the word I use because that's how my brain works. And we define strata, which is a plural for stratum, in very general terms. So anything that defines a grouping in a population. And I have some examples down here. So in this case, we clearly cannot rearrange rows because we'll be mixing observation one of stratum one with observation 10 of stratum two. And so, you know, uh, if a stratum is some kind of a um, state and our observations are on the level of county within state, we can't take one county and switch it for another county because uh, there is something um, unique that is inherent to the state that a county is in. For example, there will be state policies, uh, state, uh, states impose mask mandates when it comes to COVID-19. States have different funding um, policies and different budgets for public health. So we cannot take two counties and rearrange them together. Also, subjects, and again, the word subjects, I'm using very generally here. For my example with COVID here, the counties are the subjects. As it's often the case, a lot of public health data is aggregated um, you know, to some level above the individual to protect confidentiality. So this could be not counties, but cities within a state. And so our subjects in that case would be the cities. Our stratum in that case would be the state. And so we clearly cannot rearrange different cities if they belong to different states. So there are several general scenarios where multi-level models are absolutely necessary. And that's when measurements are clustered, clustered together. So the classic example comes to us from education. Student scores tend to be clustered within classroom, within school, within state, within country. So that is four different levels of clustering there. And hence my little image in the top right, right? That's the Ukrainian Russian nesting doll. So you can think of, you know, why would they be clustered within classroom? Well, all the students inside of a classroom had the same teacher, had the same classroom environment, had the same cultural components of the classroom. Why would the classrooms within school be uh, clustered? Well, they were all subject to the same school level policies. Um, they, um, all the classrooms within the same school probably have similar demographics because schools tend to be located in you know, certain neighborhoods of a city. Schools within a state, you know, state level policy, state level funding. States within countries, you can see that this goes on and on and on and on and on. 
Remember that subjects within the same stratum tend to share information for sort of intuitive reasons. From agriculture, I went to an ag school, UNL. So a lot of these examples um, where I was learning involved crops or animals. So weight of pigs or other animals tends to be correlated, tends to share information within pens. And actually feeding occurs where you feed all the pigs inside of a pen using one device. And so, you know, you can imagine there being some kind of a correlation. For example, if there's a disease of some sort, then um, pigs within the same pen might pick up the disease uh, more readily than pigs from different pens. Pens within farms. Same thing, you know, different farmers maybe use uh, the modern technology differently. And so uh, they purchase genetically modified uh, feeds at a different rate. So that again is this type of nesting or multi-level structure, similar to students within classrooms, within schools, et cetera, pigs within pens, within farms, same kind of multi-level structure. And I already went through my um, COVID related incidents. Publicly available data, by the way, for COVID is available at the county level uh, pretty readily through Johns Hopkins. I am less aware of uh, smaller than county level, like city or even census tract. So if you spot some, let me know. The other way that um, a, a slightly different type of clustering occurs is when we measure multiple subjects at, you know, at different time points. So if you're thinking, well, isn't this time series? It, it sort of is, it sort of is, but you tend to have a lot fewer measuring occasions. So the first um, example here comes to us from an intervention type of setting, very, very common intervention setup where you measure your subjects pre-intervention, then you intervene, measure them right post-intervention, and then after some kind of follow-up, say eight weeks. Eight weeks is an arbitrary number. Uh, a friend of mine was defending her dissertation and she had eight-week follow-up because you want to see if whatever it is you did with the subject carries through and helps and continues to help them in their life. So here you're measuring the same set of people, same set of teachers, same set of nurses, same set of salespeople. Pre-intervention, post-intervention, taking the difference if you're thinking about it, right? Uh, did you improve their life? Did you improve their understanding of something? And then again, after eight weeks, so you can think of there being clustering where the measurements on the same subject are going to be far more similar than across subjects. Now, again, the word subject, don't take that to be too literally a person or a, a bug or a, a pig, because if you think of measuring opioid or COVID mortality in different states over time, um, if you treat the state as a subject, you're continually recording information on the same geographic unit or county over time. And so the state of Wyoming is going to be far closer to its own measurement last year than it will be to the state of New York, right? So these are the two broad classes of cases where multi-level models are simply essential. So now I'd like to introduce this concept of intra-class correlation. I, I mentioned that subject that a data within the same stratum, the same population grouping, um, tends to be positively correlated. And we have a measure of that correlation. It's called intra-class correlation. Measures within stratum correlation of the outcome variable. So if ICC is really close to one, then you can think of, you know, once you know what stratum they're in, there's very little variability. Observations within the same stratum are very alike. Stratum tells you, if, you have, if your ICC is one, stratum tells you a lot about the outcome you're about to observe. If ICC is equal to zero, then observations are almost independent. And so this is also the case of just, you know, your OLS models your simple models where we assumed um, the observations are mutually independent. This is what we have been assuming to date. Even if there is some stratum that is unobserved, even if there is some stratum that is hard to measure, 
if your intraclass correlation is zero, you don't have to worry about it too much. An intraclass correlation of less than zero is mathematically possible. If you're collecting data over time and there's a negative autocorrelation, then ICC will be less than zero. But it's very, very, very rare and often nonsensical. But again, you know, I, 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 I'm very careful to say never. I, I rarely say never. I think, I think, I hope that is true across these videos. Wikipedia is remarkably useful when trying to visualize the interclass correlation. So I have a correlation that is essentially near zero. They made it negative, but you can, you can assume that's um, almost zero. And this is, you can just call it, you know, 0.9. So very close to one. I'm just going to call it close to one. So this is what I was talking about. Okay, note the clumping around the group means. So I'm gonna, I specifically didn't draw them because I wanted to draw them for you right now. So the group mean for group one would be somewhere right there. For group two would be somewhere right there. You know, group three, um, that's, I'm sorry, that's group three. You know, group four would be here. So you can see that the data is really clumpy around the group means. And so knowing what group number, which represents the stratum here, knowing what group number an observation belongs to really tells you a lot about where to expect the data. Notice how different that is when we look at the figure on the left, where there is a lot more variability within each group. That is, there's a lot more variability about the group specific means. Let's look at another example that comes from us, to us from not Wikipedia, comes to us from a professor from uh, Texas A&M University, Mark Lai. So um, this is a figure from his uh, textbook. So ICC close to zero. Again, take a look. Um, the, there is not as much clumping, right? There's no clumping, I'll call it. around subject means. And then you compare that to the ICC of 0.95, where there's a lot of clumping around group means. And actually, group means really dictate the response. And our uh, measurement occasion within person really doesn't give us a whole lot of other information, right? On the very left-hand side, measurement occasion within person, that's the actual dot, not the triangle, right? Gives us more information than in the right-hand panel where if you know where the triangle is, you can probably also come very, very close to the individual level observation, dictate the response. Well, and what happens in between? Well, it's somewhere in between. So you can sort of imagine where this is going. It is relatively rare to be on, the, on these opposite ends. If a negative ICC is very, very rare, it is also quite rare to see an ICC of exactly one or very, very close to one, or an ICC of, it's a lot more common to see an ICC that is close to zero, but exactly zero, also very, very, very rare. Most of the time, you're going to be somewhere in between. 0.2 is considered a pretty large intraclass correlation of uh, childhood education outcomes within classroom. That is a very typical and actually on the large end for how uh, in an early childhood setting, student test scores correlate within classrooms. So 0.2 is perfectly reasonable, quite frequent, and um, we will see later in this lecture an example of actually a quite large interclass correlation. And then even later in these notes, an example of quite small interclass correlation. So moving right along, just to make sure we're on the same page, if your ICC is very small, very close to zero, it is likely that the independence assumption is okay. Our multi-level model will produce uncertainties and estimates that are very similar to the standard model. And your effective sample size will be essentially equal to the number of observations. So let me make this clear. 
The effective sample size I'm talking about here has to do with your recorded data, not the effective sample size that you get in, in your MCMC, but the concepts are very similar. The effective sample size is the number of independent pieces of information that you record from your data set. If your ICC is near zero, the in number of independent pieces of information is equal to your n, number of you know, rows of your data. Let's go to the other end. And you're happy because you're, you're good. You don't have to worry about this multi-level model junk. Let's go to the other end. If your ICC is near one, so you're here, you're on this right-hand side, there was very little purpose about performing repeated measurements on these people. Because you could have just taken the triangles and ran with it, right? You have almost no additional information in the dots over the triangle. So the independence assumption is badly violated. You're the, a standard model thinks that your sample size is the total number of observations. The independent model thinks that your total sample size are the dots. But in reality, the number of independent pieces of information is actually equal to the number of strata. So in this case, all of these dots Look, maybe even 100 dots will collapse down into eight data points, eight independent data points. So you're missing the point, right? You really misrepresent the amount of positive information that you have if you don't account for that um, um, positive correlation. What happens in between? It's everything in between. Your IID model would think that your sample size is equal to the total number of observations, but your effective sample size is somewhere between the total number of dots, the total number of dots, and the total number of triangles. So we need sophisticated models to figure that out. In some fields, there's something called the design effect that is closely tied to the intraclass correlation. That sort of um, formalizes this thinking about misrepresenting the amount of information we have. So the design effect is an inflation so it's a number that is necessarily greater than one, right? It's necessarily greater than one. The design effect measures the inflation of your uncertainty in the estimates due to clustering. Inflation of the uncertainty in the estimates due to clustering. And you can see that here is the average number of observations per stratum. Here is your ICC. As your ICC increases, your design effect will increase. So if you don't account for clustering, the design effect will tell you by how much you are inflating uncertainty by using a incorrect model. So don't, don't do it. It's also a measure of efficiency, right? It's also a way for you to say, well, based on the ICC I observed by using a multi-level model, look at how efficient I'm being. I am not inflating uncertainty by this much. Now, I'll show you how that translates uh, with real data. Multi-level models also let us specify what are called varying effects. And this is a more modern way of thinking about multi-level models. So in a regular model, regular single-level model, our regular uh, IID model, we have like alpha plus X prime beta. We have just a single intercept. But we will be introducing what are called random intercepts. So we're going to introduce stratum specific effects. That then modify our overall intercept. And therefore, we can combine these two terms together to make our stratum uh, specific intercepts. We will also do something similar for slopes. And just stay tuned. I don't want to blow up my, uh, my slide currently. But by using multi-level models, we can allow every stratum to have its own intercept, that is its own mean value. And also we can have allow each stratum to have its own slope, its own association between whatever covariate and your outcome. So at this point, it might remind you of an interaction term. 
And that's, to me, not an incorrect, not a completely incorrect way of looking at it, right? If you're allowing for different associations, different slopes per stratum, that is sort of a way of thinking about it, like a stratum by X interaction. But the way we do it in a multi-level sense, it's smarter. Because when we specify an interaction, we do not share information. Now, I have a couple of slides coming up. But when we specify multi-level models, we do very much share information. And so if your ICC is high, an interaction model would likely overfit, right? Because your uh, data within the same stratum are highly correlated. But if your ICC is low, then maybe the inter an interaction type approach would be, would be okay. So we, again, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is driven by that intra-class correlation, the correlation of your outcome variable within your strat. And this can occur on multiple levels, as we've seen with the COVID case and, and with the um, student test scores case. Um, there's a couple, just, I, I want to make sure I get this out there because uh, these types of models are called different things and it's frustrating if you're trying to use multiple sources to understand this stuff. Um, let me actually do slide 10 first. So sometimes these type of models, multi-level models, are called mixed models. Yep, my um, stylus just broke, it's okay. Um, and that's because um, in, you know, even 10 years ago, you would have a set of fixed effects and a set of random effects. But really, there are both misnomers. So the random effects are like your uh, random intercepts and the random slopes. They are the things that let your strata have their own means, and they're the things that let your strata have their own slopes. And they would get a distribution. In a frequentist world, those would be the only things that got a distribution. But in a Bayesian world, everything gets a distribution. And so you know, it's it's really silly to pay attention to those things that get a distribution because everything in a Bayesian world gets a distribution. Also, the, it's a misnomer to call something a fixed effect. It really uh, messes with our thinking because they still have to be estimated and they have standard errors. So there's variability in the fixed effects. Random effects, in a, in a normal, with a normal likelihood, these are linear combinations of matrices. So there are nothing random about it. There's a set solution to these based on a set of matrices. They're called the uh, uh, normal, the, ooh, forget, normal equations, I believe, due to Henderson, 1965. Don't quote me on that. Also, the way we think about these types of models has changed as, as you know, software has evolved. So in the ye olde mixed models, there used to be a set of rules for when you would quote unquote treat something as random. Remember, it used to be a big deal to treat something as random. And these rules, if you feel really strongly about it, there goes my stylus. If you feel really strongly about it, you can read some stuff. And I rarely give you my own stuff to read, but I suppose I'm uh, somewhat uh, proud of, of the, this particular passage. Uh, a reviewer asked me to add it. And I did. The big idea is that the strata that we observe, the classrooms we observe, the schools that make it into our sample, are a sample of a bigger population to which we want to generalize findings. So this is almost always the case. You, you, you never have the uh, funds to go around and do something in every single school in your school district or you almost never sample every single classroom from every single school of the school district. So naturally, classrooms are a sample from a larger population and the schools are a sample from a larger population. Also, there was a thing about, well, but we don't care about the stratum specific estimates. We care about the other set of estimates that average across strata. That too is sort of gone by the wayside because we very much care about these varying effects from this slide, from, excuse me, this slide. We very much care about the, uh, you know, slopes within different strata and how much they vary. It's, it's incorrect to say that we don't care about them. So the, in, in a modern sense, 
we sort of use the, these types of models, more of a computational tool to specify our varying effects. Those effects that vary by stratum, and that could be something as only an intercept, or it can be a set of slopes. But we think of uh, multi-level models as a tool to use the information efficiently, to share information within stratum uh, in a way that is efficient. End of day. All right, we have two slides with some heavy notation coming up right now. But um, I'm trying to make it, I'm trying to contrast using a random intercept approach where we, in, we have a certain number of strata and the J subscript denotes those things that vary with stratum. In this case, it's only this one thing. And you can see that this, these random deviations modify our population intercept. And so for the first stratum, our estimate would be this. For the second stratum, our estimate would be this, so on and so forth. So I hear what, what you're saying. Well, couldn't we just include stratum as a categorical effect like we did in the Airbnb example, like we did with the smoking example? Can't we just include a set of dummy variables? that indicate what stratum our uh, observation belongs in. We sure could, we sure could. And then and this is what it would look like. Here we have a, a coefficient and a dummy variable. And then we have S such coefficients and dummy variables. But notice, first of all, there's a difference in interpretation because now these, are, these U's would be a modification to the reference group. And, you, and by now you know that reference group is very much arbitrary. On the left-hand side, the U's are modifying the population average. It's how you're different from the population average. On the right-hand side, the U's are how you're different from a reference level that can be reset by the next guy or girl analyzing your data. Next bit of, of difference. Next bit of difference. We will assume that these deviations, these UJs, how each stratum is different from the population, come from the same normal distribution, where the sigma term will be estimated. So because all of our UJs come from the same normal distribution, they share information. Right? Here's a normal distribution. Things are going to be just naturally pushed in towards zero and less likely to be way out in the tails. If you're estimating things the same way we have been doing, you have to assign a different prior per coefficient. And so they come from different normal distributions. Even if, you, even if you set the same prior to all of them, and that could be a good idea or a bad idea, I don't know, it's different for different data, but they come from different normal distributions so they don't share information. So you're leaving possible uh, efficiency on the table. You could share information if you go with the uh, random intercept route, and you would leave that on the table if you go with these sort of um, naive dummy variable route. Okay, you have now made a mean, and now we go, we go back to everything we've learned before. Specify a likelihood. If it's a normal, just plug it in. If it's a Poisson or a negative binomial, exponentiate it, right? That's the, there's, there's our inverse link function right there. If you have a, binu, a binomial, <laughs> Bernoulli or a binomial, okay, inverse logitic. So there's, uh, you know, there's nothing special that happens once you put the mean together. What is special about multi-level models are these deviations, how they're treated, because they come from the same normal distribution where the sigma term is going to be estimated. I'm going to introduce one more level of complexity before we get into an example. What if we not only let the intercept differ by stratum, 
What if we also want the slope to differ by stratum? So here we're including the UJs to allow there to be different intercepts, but we're also including something that we're calling WJ that modifies the population slope. These WJs will come from their own normal distribution Right, so they're centered at zero. So our WJs can be negative or positive, right? So we can be uh, a little bit flatter in some strata and a little bit steeper in other strata. Similar to before, because the U's come from the same distribution and the W's come from the same distribution, there is shared information between our intercepts now and our slopes. And as before, this sigma w will be estimated. How will we do it in a naive way? Well, we can uh, specify an interaction term, right? A stratum by x interaction term to force um, the slope to be different inside every stratum. But as before, even if you assign the same prior the actual parameters don't come from the same distribution. They come from S different distributions and they don't share information. And then that is your, your leaving information on the table. That design effect will tell you how much you're losing out. That design effect will tell you by how much you are inflating uncertainty by uh, not accounting for shared information, by not accounting for positive correlation among observations within the same strap. So I specifically kept things pretty general to this point because we're gonna dive into an example, but really I can't possibly cover every example uh, where there would be a stratum, uh, you know, a random intercept or a random slope, right? We're gonna only cover one example where I'm gonna demonstrate these things. I can't possibly cover every example, but I hope that these two slides will arm you with some conceptual information to present to your advisor, to your collaborators, who are maybe trying to analyze it this way. And you're like, no, don't do it that way. So I hope that um, these two slides, although general, will still be quite useful. All right. This um, data set, it comes preloaded with the LMME4 package. Um, it's, uh, from a, it's from a real study, uh, and it is one that is used pretty widely to teach multi-level models because it works out really nicely. And it's a fairly interesting intuitive example. So they got 18 volunteers, and I can talk all day about volunteer samples, like who are these people who uh, volunteered to do something on three hours of sleep for 10 consecutive days? You know, you can think of these people, are they, uh, are they uh, medical professionals? Probably not. Are they people with demanding, uh, you know, mach heavy machinery jobs? Probably not. So who are these 18 volunteers? So that, you know, uh, some design issues for sure, uh, but I just wanna just point that out. The outcome is the average reaction time in milliseconds on a series of tests that they average together. We only have two covariates in the entire study. This is, it's very easy for me to show you what the data set looks like. We only have what day of the study we're on. They were on regular sleep on day zero. And what is my subject ID, which is just random subject ID. The goal is to study how reaction time is affected, pretty likely deteriorates how reaction time deteriorates um, as a function of how many days on very little sleep um, uh, you've been living. Okay, so how are the data clustered? Well, our reaction times are very much going to be clustered by subject. Some people just naturally um, have quicker reflexes. Some people naturally are less affected by little sleep. I'm somebody that uh, doesn't need a ton of sleep. I pretty regularly go on four, five, six hours of sleep. But there are other people can't do it, right? They need eight, nine, 10 hours of sleep. I'm somebody that cannot possibly function in the morning. 
and other people love morning stuff. So um, there is some natural, maybe genetic material there that um, uh, is picking up some of that variability in reaction time. So data are very much clustered by subject. Do old timey random effect rules make sense here? Absolutely. So I'm talking about the subjects, the 18 volunteers we have in this study come from a bigger population of people to whom we want to generalize our findings. That is entirely correct, right? We wouldn't care about uh, quantifying how a lack of sleep affects these 18. No, we want to generalize to the greater population to say something about the importance of, reg of getting uh, regular sleep. So 100% uh, old timey quote unquote rules certainly apply here. And we'll flip back into R. I have code to reproduce these uh, exploratory figures. I'm gonna flip into R when we learn how to do prior predictive simulation, which is relatively complex, relatively complex for multi-level models. But um, here is sort of a reproduction of that um, ICC figure, which the Xs give us the subject specific means. I just plotted the averages, average reaction time, of all 18 of our subjects, those are the red Xs, and their um, individual measurement on every single day, how it measures. So for example, we see that the first subject has a lot of variability around their mean. Uh, we don't have gender in the study actually. Whereas the second subject has very little variability around their um, sample, uh, their mean. And it looks like on average, that second subject is quite a bit uh, faster with the test than the first subject. The overall um, mean here was about almost 300 milliseconds. Almost 300 milliseconds. So it is helpful to sort of note how much the subject means deviate on average from the population mean to develop intuition about the scale of things. And it looks like almost all, it looks like almost all of our subject means are within, oh, I don't know, 50 milliseconds of our grand mean. Remember the interpretation of sigma, it's the average distance that our data is uh, from the mean. So remember that number, 50 milliseconds. On the right, we add the days. As a, um, as a preview, I will not be centering and scaling my days because I like what the zero represents here. And that is similar to what, what we had in our second homework assignment when we didn't center and scale the weight of diamonds because I really like what the weight of zero represents. You don't have a diamond. So a day of zero means that's the people on regular sleep, almost their baseline reaction time then. And then you can see each line is a different subject. So there are 18 lines there. Some people were almost unaffected by staying up, you know, with, and having only three hours of sleep for 10 nights. Some people were, well, sort of more badly affected, but this is observed data, right? So we will fit models to sort of formalize and um, uh, disentangle the systematic variation systematic variation due to the days and systematic variation due to subjects. You're thinking we're gonna use multi-level models to let every subject have their own intercept and eventually let every subject possibly have their own slope. That's our preview, that's where we're going. Okay, you guys ready? New material, hard hitting, here it comes. The mean and the likelihood should be very, very familiar at this point. The difference is right here where I pointed it out. I said new, pay attention to this. Here is the overall intercept alpha. In the case of this, it's, I don't know, around 250 milliseconds. UJs are our subject specific deviations from the um, intercept. 
And so therefore, our subject-specific intercepts, right? The few j's are the deviations. And the subject-specific intercepts are then the sums. And that's why I put a little uh, parentheses there to sort of drive home the point that the uj's modify the intercept. Eventually, we will introduce another set that will modify the slope. Right now, we're only allowing the intercept to be uh, modified. So let's look at the new things that we have to incorporate into the model. We specify a common distribution for all of our UJs. So 18 effects come out of the same normal distribution with a mean that is hard coded at zero because some are gonna be above the overall mean, some are gonna be below the overall mean, but we're, but we're sort of hard coding the fact that it's most likely that they're gonna be near the population mean. How wide that normal distribution is will be estimated. That sigma u is not a hyperparameter. That sigma u has a prior, that is a new prior. It is a half normal distribution. And so we are sort of estimating the prior standard deviation for our subject specific deviations. So let me flip into R and show how um, we perform a prior predictive simulation here. We need a new package because I'll be using the half normal prior and it's uh, extra dist uh, package. I'm reminding you here of the uh, equation for the mean. So we start our prior predictive simulation by taking um, some samples of the standard deviation of, let me just focus us on, on uh, where we are in this prior predictive simulation. We're going to start right there by, because um, these U's are dependent on the sample of sigma U. We're going to start by taking a sample of sigma U and then, and then we're going to produce a set of UJs per sample of sigma U. Let me repeat that. Because UJs, our subject specific deviations, are dependent on our estimate of sigma u, we're going to produce a different set of UJs per sample of sigma u. And then we're going to propagate it up, right? We're going to propagate it up into the mean and into the normal likelihood. So I start the whole thing by sampling from a half normal. Sigma 50. And let's just see what this looks like. Okay. So the half normal distribution is kind of what you would think it would look like. It uh, looks like half of a bell curve, but it still integrates to one because it's a real distribution. If you take a regular normal distribution and you cut it in half, it won't integrate to one because it will integrate to a half. The half normal distribution is taller than half of a regular normal distribution near zero. Or priors of the standard deviation, they're all half normal zero something. And so this package doesn't even let you specify the mean. It just has this sigma component to it. And you can see, all right, well, this, this is what the samples of our uh, between person means. Um, this is the sample of our uh, between person standard deviations. And you can see if I make this sigma very small, we will reduce the uh, possible values for that sigma. And they return into 50. All right, let's build some intuition around uh, the kinds of means that are produced. So if I take the summary, and to be clear, I'm now here. If I take the summary of this, all right, looks like the average was not 50. The average was like 39 point something. The median was 32. So although I'm aiming for 50, and how would I get 50? 
because I've noticed that most of the subject means are within 50 milliseconds of the overall mean. So I'm sort of in my mind aiming for 50. The mean that's produced is less than 50 and the median is even less than 50, right? The mean is, is affected more by the uh, right, by the things in the right hand tail. So if we look up what the um, sort of the closed form solution for the half normal is, it's square root two over pi times sigma. So you could, if you wanted to, by the way, square root of two over pi, is 0.8. So the mean will be about 0.8 times whatever value you put in here. So if you wanted to say one over 0.8 times that value, you can sort of um, um, tune it in. But I don't worry too much about it because it's, the, it's a prior distribution, it's still a prior distribution. Next, I said, and I will repeat just to make sure we're on the same page. These sets of U's depend on each individual sample of sigma. So for each of my samples, for each i sample I produce, here I do this for uh, six subjects, I will produce a set, a separate set of UJs. The rest of um, these two lines you should be familiar, familiar with. Those are just the... Um, uh, samples uh, from a normal distribution for alpha and beta. Um, this intercept right here, it, it, it describes what's happening on day zero. So the average there is at 250, right? The average is at 250. I'm picking 50 as a pretty reasonable number. And look, I, I am not centering and scaling my covariate. And so here I can get rid of some of these lines. And so when you're thinking of a slope, you're thinking rise over run. So when I run five days, my slope changes by about 50 milliseconds. And then when I run another five days, it changes by, I don't know, maybe another 50 milliseconds. So I'm thinking that the a slope is pretty near 10. That's why I have my mean set at 10 there. I'm allowing very much so, that's hyperstandard deviation to be large enough that zero is incorporated. So I'm allowing that uh, zero to enter the picture. I'm gonna do this for six different subjects. So the first thing I'm gonna do in here, I'll have six panels, right? I'll have a separate set of lines per subject that are only different, the six panels, by this UJ. So I will be, I have two loops as opposed to one loop. Before we just had the one loop in here, but now we have two loops. We first loop over the six subjects. Why six? Because I didn't want 18 panels, right? It's really hard to tell what's going on with 18 panels. You will see it's hard to go to understand what's going on with six panels. So I'll have six panels, six subjects. I will be making a separate plot for the six subjects. And then within each panel, I will generate 500 regression lines. Each regression line, right, is different by this thing I just highlighted on line 63, which is the subject specific intercept. Look, we're not messing with the slope at all. This slope is not, it's not dependent on J, right? This slope is gonna be exactly the same for every subject, but we're gonna um, incorporate the unique information from each subject into each panel. All right, enough talking, more showing. Fascinating. Different every time I run it, right? Because it's, it's a random process and it's just taking a little bit of time because I'm trying to uh, produce, um, I'm trying to produce 500 times six, 3000 lines. Fascinating, okay, look at what's happening. I'm recording the average UJs and here this subject on average is three milliseconds uh, faster, right? Three milliseconds smaller reaction time means they're three milliseconds faster than the overall average. Subject number two, five milliseconds slower than the overall average. Five milliseconds slower, six milliseconds faster. So 
I can just demonstrate that if I don't go up here, if I leave this alone, if I leave this alone, I keep the this part of the model constant and just perform the prior predictive simulation within each subject. I'm going to keep those UJs constant. So look, I can rerun this now. I can just change one of these guys. I can change one of these guys. It will not affect the average UJs because I didn't draw anything new per subject. Just to be clear, I didn't touch this part. All of that stays the same. I've only changed what happens within subject. Once we introduce that subject specific special sauce into the uh, formula. I, I, this is fairly complex and, and I, that's why I'm repeating myself a lot and going relatively slow. I also have a ton of uh, comments, of course, come by office hours if, um, if you'd like, there it is. So what I did just to make sure we saw the difference, I changed that um, hyper standard deviation of the slope to be teeny tiny, right? All of those slopes are now very, very similar. And it makes it kind of easy to see how much, for example, this subject up here, subject number three, is a little bit different than subject number four, right? Their, their averages are 10 milliseconds apart. And if you look at these UJs, unique information that we get per subject, these UJs are how much these subjects deviate from the population average. I'm, I'm gonna flip back, I should, they should be identical because I did not re-simulate uh, subject-specific information, right? I did change the hyperstandard deviation of the slope. I did not simulate those sig sigma u's again. I did not generate a new set of uj's conditional on those sigma u's. Okay, I think this was at 10 before. All in all, I think this, feel free to play around with it, all in all, this produces a fairly reasonable set of, um, of lines. I think this is a bit too consistent a slope. I think what, I will, what I'm about to receive, which by the way, will feature, I believe, a new set of UJs, because I did go up here and I grabbed the, I simulated a whole new set of SDUs. I simulated a whole new set of random intercepts conditional on those SDUs. And then I still generated these population slope and population intercept. So look, this is a subject that is very close to the population mean. This is a subject that is four and a half milliseconds slower than the population mean. This is a subject that is two milliseconds faster than the population mean. I'm pretty happy with this set of um, hyperparameters. So half normal 50, that is informing my set of random intercepts. My alpha centered at 250, 250 being right around there, right around the average reaction time on day zero. So day zero is of course the baseline where they got regular sleep. And I'm encoding a positive slope. I'm comfortable with that, but I'm allowing, I'm picking a hyper standard deviation that is very much allowing for that mean to cross zero comfortably. And there are some negative lines here too, but not that many. A negative line would mean that we actually get faster the less sleep we get. And that's very, very unlikely. Okay. We are ready to go, guys. We are ready to go. We're about to fit our first multi-level model. I'm freaking jazzed, guys. Freaking jazzed. Okay. One Vertical line subject means we're going to, one is an intercept. Vertical line subject means we're going to introduce a random intercept per subject. So whatever intercept goes indicates the one. Vertical line, whatever your stratum strata are, whatever your stratum represents, goes on the right-hand side there. Days is our overall effect that does not change with subject. All right, so the, inter the, the formula is quite simple. Right there, we are, we are modeling that um, 
this line right here is sigma u half normal um, 0, 50. I know that doesn't say half normal. I know that says normal. But because the class is a standard deviation, it automatically assumes a half normal. How do you make a half t instead? If you want a bigger tail, you say t here. And because the class is SD, it assumes that you really meant a half t. How uh, do you specify a half Cauchy if you really wanted to, if you wanted to introduce even more craziness? You specify that class to be SD and you say this to be Cauchy. So you don't actually type half normal, it's assumed based on the class of that you tell the RMS. This is self-explanatory, this is self-explanatory, and this is the error term that, by the way, we're just going to go ahead and use the half normal distribution anyway. The half normal distribution tends to behave better than the exponential because it's flatter around zero. Um, and so why not? Why not? This too is now a half normal. Sigma error, which goes into the likelihood. Now I'm talking about this term right here, right? This is now distributed according to a half normal zero. If you half normal, zero, 50. By the way, I think the half normal distribution is new enough that there is not yet sort of a tried and true notation for it. I have seen HN as being half normal. I have also seen this where it's N plus zero, 50 to indicate half normal. I have seen it written out as half normal. So um, just be careful, depending on, on the field you're in, a half normal may look a whole lot of different ways. The rest of the estimation routine looks the same. We haven't changed it for months now. And that is, of course, the power of um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. It just tends to work. Let's take a look at some results uh, to close out this hour. Our estimated between subject intercept, that's that sigma u term, is 39.33. We get a credible interval for it. Everything converges, all that stuff. So what this means is at any given number of days, about 68% of the subject means are going to be within one standard deviation of the population mean. So I'm just using the normal sort of rule of thumb. 95% of the subject means are gonna be within two standard deviations, right? We're just using the, the normal rule of thumb there. Here on the bottom, we get that beta day. So on average, averaged over our subjects and specifically, in the population, right? This is a population averaged effect. In the population from which our subjects came from, very important. In the population from which our subjects came from, even though our subject were, subjects were a volunteer sample, in the populations where our subjects came from, you get about 10 and a half milliseconds slower per day. 10 milliseconds slower per day. This sigma is the error variance within subject. Once we know what subject we are looking at, this error sigma will tell us um, how data deviates from that subject specific line. Okay. Just to bring this all the way around. All right. 68%. Of the subject means are going to be within one standard deviation of the population line. The slope of that line is about 10 and a half milliseconds per day. And I spent the first half of lecture today talking about the interclass correlation. Here, in general, it's sigma squared, not sigma, right? These are, these are sigmas right here, right? These are SDs. The interclass correlation is a function of the variances, not the sigmas, okay? Don't make that mistake. 
So if we're going to compute the interclass correlation, we're going to square our sigma term, square our residual error term, and we will produce an interclass correlation that is fairly large, 0.61. That is uh, about 60% of the information about reaction time is shared within subject. 40% is uh, determined by how, how long they were um, uh, uh, starved of sleep. If we go back to our design effect slide, we go back to our design effect slide, okay? Whoops. So again, bringing this all the way around. If we go back to our design effect slide, that ICC is 0.61. We had 180 observations and 18 strata. So N over, it, it was 10 observations per subject, right? 10 days. So it's 10 over here, minus one times 0.61, and we add that to one. So one plus nine times 0.61, all right? Design effect, uh, one plus nine, over 0.61. So if we did not account, if we did not account for the clustering due to subject, we will be inflating the uncertainty in our estimates by six and a half times. So very clearly, it makes sense for us to treat subject as a random intercept and account for that clustering. And I think I will stop here. I will stop right here, pick it up next time. Quick review of what we have learned. We've learned a lot of material. I think this is going to be about an hour long lecture. Learned a lot of material that um, play around with that prior predictive simulation and try and track the fact that everything starts with this generate generating these sigma u's, which is how different are the subjects around our population mean. Here, I'm going to blow it up for us. Now our subjects are going to be super different around the population mean. I'll keep everything else the same. So you will see what happens. Our UJs, our average UJ is going to be super different now. Just take a second to generate uh, six times 500, 3,000 regression lines, and there it is. So, well, at random, it looks like we're actually pretty close here in five of the six subjects. But subject number four is 10 milliseconds slower than the population average as a function of that standard deviation. So look, conditional on that standard, on those, all of those 500 samples, right? I have a loop here and I generate a separate set of six random UJs per each one of the 500 samples. And then I have two loops, two loops. Make sure you, you look at my code and you can track it. I first sort of incorporate the subject information, something that is unique per subject. And then within each panel, I generate 500 regression lines. There is the unique information, right? This is now a matrix. I throw 500 rows. J columns because I have six, a set of six random effects per subject. These subject specific intercepts only affect my alpha. I didn't need, you know, mathematically to have those uh, brackets there, but I want to for, for visual sake. My slope is the same. And if we constrict that slope to be teeny tiny, you will see that. I can restrict those slopes to be almost identical. So here is the last picture I will show you and we'll let you guys go. If you stuck with me, then Godspeed to you because uh, this stuff was dense, but I'm so excited because we're, we're getting more and more useful to analyze um, you know, a variety of, of data set, cluster data now. Stick with me. There we go. Look, we now, are uh, all of these lines are the same, right? 
very almost very very uh, parallel lines because we we restricted that hyperstandard deviation to be teeny tiny. But look, we now are allowing our subjects to be 31 milliseconds looks like faster than the population average, 25 milliseconds slower than the population average because of how large we made that sigma. 50 was the number here, 10 was the number here. Thank you guys for your attention. I really appreciate it. Stay safe. I will see you guys next week. Thank you.